Clarence McClendon is a popular Christian leader and is the senior pastor at Full Harvest International Church in California. But today we're going to be testing some of his teachings to see if he can correctly handle the Word of God. Hello friends, welcome to my channel. My name is Matt. If you could please take a second to subscribe to help promote Christian content on YouTube, I would greatly appreciate it. So as I said, guys, today we're going to test the teaching of Clarence McClendon. We're going to be looking at a sermon he did just a few months ago entitled, The Best is Upon You. So we're going to watch three short clips. We're going to come back and assess it and test what he's saying against the Word of God to see if he is rightly handling Scripture. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into our first clip. Now in the name of Jesus, we take authority over every work of the enemy. Satan, we declare to you, your contracts are canceled and your power is broken. We command you to loose our brothers and let our sisters go free. And we declare this a day of revelation, of illumination, of breakthrough, of celebration, of release, of restoration. And in the name of Jesus now, we release the spirit of wisdom and of revelation knowledge in the anointed Jesus and in his anointing, we release the ministry of angels in this place. All of those angels that have earth assignments connected to this people under the sound of my voice. All right, so to be fair, in this first clip, Clarence McClendon is not teaching. He's actually still in his prayer, but I thought his prayer offered us a pretty profound glimpse into his theology, and we can see where he is off. So if you noticed at the beginning of the prayer, he was speaking to Satan, and he was taking authority over Satan and canceling some of the work of Satan. I think he said something about canceling or breaking contracts, right? So he's speaking to Satan. He's taking authority over him. I would like to call your attention to the book of Jude because the book of Jude actually has something to say about this practice. Now, Jude is only one chapter long. We're going to pick it up in verse 8, but this passage of scripture is talking about ungodly sinful people. So let's read. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct as irrational animals do, will destroy them. So, did you notice that one of the characteristics of these ungodly people is that they slander celestial beings, uh, meaning that they speak down against angels, good angels or bad angels. Even speaking against bad angels is seen as something that ungodly people do. And then the example was given of the archangel Michael, disputing with the devil over the body of Moses, which is not something that is recorded in Scripture. It is something that is found uh, in a book, a work outside of Scripture called The Assumption of Moses. But the example is given here in the inspired text that even the archangel Michael, when disputing with Satan himself, did not heap abuse against Satan, but rather appealed to the Lord and said, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. So even the archangel Michael would not speak directly to Satan in such a way. And so this is a really unhealthy practice that we see, unfortunately, in many churches. Guys, we do not uh, sit and speak to Satan and take authority over him. And you do not bind Satan. That will have to be a different video I'll have to do showing how when people say they can bind and lose and they can bind Satan, they are taking that passage of scripture out of context as well. But there is a certain amount of, I don't know if the correct word is respect, but this is, Satan is evil and wicked, and certainly we don't respect the things that he does. But we, we need to understand that we are human, and wicked and evil, he is still a celestial being, and therefore we appeal to God. We don't, we don't try to handle things on our own. One of the other things I wanted to point out, because I think some of the problems with this theology comes from the fact that as Clarence McClendon was just teaching, we have the authority to do this sort of thing. And um, I actually used to be caught up in that sort of teaching as well early on in my Christian walk that 
I have authority to do all these things. And I noticed that when it was being taught to me, the main verse that it would people would point to is Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And so I want to just read that really quick to see what it says about the believer's authority. Okay. So Jesus speaking, verse 19, or sorry, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them, the disciples, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, let's start again at the very beginning. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So who has all authority been given to? Jesus. Jesus says, Therefore, what does that mean? Because all authority has been given to Jesus, now we as believers are to go make disciples of all nations. Guys, I hope you see that it is a reach to say that because Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations, that means that all authority was given to us to do everything just as Jesus. Like Jesus has all authority. Whatever he says will come to pass. Uh, that is a massive leap. Jesus is saying he has all authority all authority and therefore we can trust in him and we can go and we can be confident because what he said at the end is I am with you. So our confidence is in the fact that the one who has all authority is with us, not that we ourselves within ourselves have that sort of authority. So this is a real misunderstanding of how authority works and how we should even approach problems with the evil one. All right, so that was kind of assessing a prayer. I don't know that I've ever done that one before. Uh, now we're going to get into some of his teaching, and trust me, guys, it's about to get a lot worse. And the Word of God reads, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Look at verse 35. Women received their dead raised to life. Now, I could go on there, but I want to skip for the sake of time down to verse number 39. And I want you to read this, and I want you to remember that this was in your Bible when you came in. <laughs> that, that I didn't write it there, I didn't put it there, it was there. Watch this, verse 39, and said, all, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Wait a minute. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Would you say, did not receive the promise? Did not receive the promise. Did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us. Oh, goodness. When they were singing, the best is yet to come, I was about to run through here. <laughs> because that's exactly what the Lord said to me. He said, I want you to minister on something better for us, and I want you to tell the people of God that the better is upon them now. It's upon them now. It's not about to happen, not getting ready to happen, not fixing to happen. It's on you now. All right, so in that clip, Clarence McClendon looking at a portion of Hebrews chapter 11 and all of the great things that happened to these mighty people of faith and then coming to the end and saying, look, they did not receive the promise. There was something better. And then he transitions to focus on us to say the better is upon us now. The better is coming. Guys, this is one of the most evil and wicked things I've ever seen. To see somebody blatantly disregard a scripture and to say that he's skipping ahead for the sake of time. You may have caught that. He stopped reading in the middle of verse 35 and said, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip ahead. 
I would like to show you, I normally do not like to get into people's intentions and say this is what they were trying to do, but this is maybe one of the few cases where I can say I am positive I know what Clarence McClendon is doing because if he would have just read the rest of that passage, he could not have made his point at the end. There's a reason he had to skip it. So let's read the entire passage of Hebrews chapter 11. Let's start in verse 32 where he did. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who sh shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Now, notice... That is where he stopped and he said, oh, for the sake of time, I need to skip ahead. But do you notice that everything up to this point has been really positive? Mouths of lions being shut, people being raised from the dead. I mean, it's all wonderful stuff. Well, let's pick up and continue reading what happens here. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they may gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Now again, guys, I really try to not say, this is what this person is trying to do. I know their thoughts. I know their intentions. But it seems pretty clear to me there is a reason he skipped all of those verses because it turned to negative things. People who were tremendous people of faith, they were persecuted. Some of them were poor. They were destitute. Some of them were killed and martyred for the faith. But this goes against the theology that is taught by Clarence McClendon, which is word of faith, prosperity, theology, that it is always God's will that you be healthy and wealthy and whole and only good things, only the better that is to come. It goes completely against it, so he has to stop at the moment it is starting to say that these things happen to good, faithful people. He skips it. So there is that is evil and wicked, guys, when you are intentionally leaving out portions of Scripture. I know Clarence McClendon read this. I know he saw this, and he skipped over it on purpose to mislead people. He then went on to verses 39 and 40, and he talked about they didn't receive the promise because there was something better. And it seems to me, now this is where I'll be careful, it seems to me that what he was trying to say is they had great things happen to them, but it wasn't even the best, and we will get to receive what is best. Now, let's, let's actually read verses 39 and 40 at the end of Hebrews 11. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So only together with us would they be made perfect. Guys, let me tell you what this is referring to. Maybe you've never been taught this before, or maybe you do know it. Um, Sometimes people ask, how are people in the Old Testament saved? The answer is, people in the Old Testament were saved by the blood of Christ, by faith in Christ. And so when Jesus Christ made the sacrifice on the cross, his blood was not only good for the people who were living at that time and who would come after, it was also for people who were living by faith before him. It was applied to the people in the past as well. That's why it says that they, meaning the people of the Old Testament who were living by faith, would be together with us made perfect. That is why it says they didn't receive the promise because guess what? They were not yet justified totally until the work of Christ. So this doesn't have to do with good situations in their life. This is saying that the people of faith in the Old Testament and Current believers and believers to come are all justified and made right with God in the same way. And it is by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his perfect obedience, his perfect righteousness. So this is really horrible to me that he is making it seem like this text is about something that it's not about whatsoever. And so I hope this gives you a better understanding of Hebrews 11 and what it's actually about.
and maybe more importantly, what it's not about. It is not about you having the better and you having the more coming upon you right now. All right, guys, with that, we have one more clip that we're going to analyze. So let's go ahead and get into it. Now, look at what Jesus says. He says, do not think, verse 17, that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill or to fill full. I came to fill it up full. Are you still here? I said, are you still here? Now watch this. Watch what he said. For surely I said, and this, this is the part we, 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 we get wrong when we quote it. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or tittle, which is the equivalent of a comma or period, will by no means move from the law till all is fulfilled. Now hear what he said. He said, nothing will be removed from the law until it is all fulfilled. And he, oh God, and he said, I came to fulfill it. So, so if he said, it won't pass away until it's all fulfilled and he came to fulfill it, then what happened when he fulfilled it is it was moved out of the way. Oh God. You say, Bishop McClendon, how can you say such a thing? Because I can read. Well, Clarence McClendon may know how to read, but it does not seem like he knows how to correctly handle God's word. Let's look at this passage of scripture from Matthew chapter 5. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So what did Jesus mean when he said he didn't come to abolish them, he came to fulfill them? Well, if you read any good theologian, they will tell you that the Old Testament law really was broken down into three categories. You had the judicial law, you had the ceremonial law, and you had the moral law. Well, Jesus fulfilled all three components of that law. So the judicial law having to do with God's justice, God or Christ was the perfect fulfillment, the perfect representative of God's justice and of his righteousness. The moral law, Christ fulfilled by actually living out all of the demands, all of the commandments within the law, the only person to ever actually do that. And with the ceremonial law, so things such as sacrifices and festivals, feast days, those were all things that were actually pointing ahead towards Christ. Like the Old Testament sacrificial system and having to kill all the different animals, that was pointing ahead to the ultimate Lamb of God who was going to come as a sacrifice for the sins of the entire world. And so Christ was the fulfillment of those things, but especially as it pertains to the moral law, uh, Christ being the fulfillment of the moral law does not mean that God's moral obligations are not binding uh, anymore or that we don't need to live out those commandments. In fact, we're going to see Jesus address that now in verse 18. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So he's saying nothing is going to be changed in the law until everything is accomplished. Now, you may have noticed this, that Clarence McClendon was using a very specific translation. In his translation, it did not say until everything is accomplished. I think it just said, uh, let's see, actually, I can look. It said, until all is fulfilled. And he said, well, Jesus already said he was the fulfillment, but he's not understanding there's a distinction being made here. Jesus said he was the fulfillment of the law, but now when he's saying until all is fulfilled, he's not talking about the law anymore. He's saying until everything is accomplished. Well, what is everything? Everything that Christ has to do, meaning the rest of his earthly ministry, also his current ministry as intercessor, and when he returns. Because did you notice in verse 18, it says, until heaven and earth disappear. Guys, when Christ returns, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And at that point, the law will disappear because we will all be made perfect. There will be no more sin. There will be no more temptation. There will be no need for a law because we will be made perfect. Until that time, we are still to live and carry out 
God's commandments. Now, as I have already stated, we understand that there were different types of commandments. We had things such as the sacrificial system and many of the festivals and things of that nature that we do not observe, but that does not take away from the truthfulness of what we read in the Old Testament. We don't observe them because Christ, those things were actually pointing us toward Christ. The moral law is is showing us God's justice. God's justice and God's righteousness has not changed. We still live that out. In fact, I want to point you, this might help clarify things. Let's look at 1 Timothy verse 8. It says, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. The law is good. The Apostle Paul talks about this all throughout the book of Romans. He is going on and on about how the law is good. But here, Timothy, or in his letter to Timothy, uh, Paul is saying it is good if we use it properly. So how do we properly use the law? Well, first, let's talk about how we improperly use the law. We improperly use the law if we think that we are somehow going to be made right with God because we keep off his commandments. Because, newsflash, we don't keep off his commandments, right? We break his commandments. We could never be made right with God by trying to be a good person and fulfill all of his commandments. It will not work. We only trust in the finished work of Christ. We trust in his righteousness and what he's done on our behalf. Yet, At the same time, we know that the law shows us God's righteousness, his good moral uh, standards. And we, out of love and thankfulness and gratitude for what he has done for us, should strive to live those out to the best of our ability. We should obey his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. He does not cast aside his laws. He tells us to obey, to repent, turn from our wicked ways, and to follow after him and to follow his teachings and his commandments. In fact, I already looked earlier at Matthew 28, the Great Commission, where Jesus said uh, that as we go and make disciples of all uh, nations, we are to teach them to obey everything that he taught, right? We are to teach them to, uh, to obey Christ's teachings, his commandments, what he told us to do. And so, Man, this is really, really, guys, this is awful. I hope you see how big of a problem this is, that there is a person who who says that they are a pastor, they claim to be a Christian, and they are telling Christians that other Christians, you don't need to follow the law whatsoever. This is absolutely terrible, guys. This is actually the only sermon I've ever watched of Clarence McClendon, so I can't really speak to his ministry as a whole, but I can tell you just based off of what I have witnessed in this one sermon— Guys, you really need to stay away from him because if he's making these sorts of egregious mistakes, there is no telling what other sorts of bad theology, bad doctrine he has going on. So let's stay far away from his teaching and his ministry. Okay, guys, that's all I have for you today. I hope that this has been helpful. Uh, As I say from time to time here, guys, my, my main point in doing this is not just so I can like call people out for bad things because I somehow feel good about doing it. It's to try to equip you as a believer, to try to equip the body of Christ to recognize bad teaching when you see it, to think biblically, and to to exercise discernment when you're listening to Christian teaching. So I hope that this has been helpful to you. If it has been, if you would please consider subscribing again, I would really appreciate it. But thanks again for watching, and until next time, God bless.